So now I'm going to talk to about what that uh, community project evolution is going to look like. And, and probably a, a quick info about myself. Uh, I lead the cellular programs at Facebook Connectivity on the engineering team. And it's my great pleasure to, to thank you all for joining us today. Um, during these times of uh, pandemic, stuck at home, and there, there really uh, aren't a lot of things that are going on. Um, and you're, you're all working. And we still appreciate the time you're taking with us today, and hopefully you find it useful. And I, I'm I'm quite excited to be to be speaking at Neil's keynote and this fireside chat we just had with the greatest minds of the industry, especially when it comes to open source projects that are potential to disrupt the industry and bring the future closer to us. Whereas less digital divide, less neutral uh, network divide, and there is less division overall per se. And I'd like to talk about how we're evolving Magma. This project is very near and dear to me into a full-blown community project with participation from a large number of contributors. We have big companies and startups, operators and service providers, industry groups, and the ecosystem all aligned to build what we call the Kubernetes of the network core together. So let's do it. So let me start with a story that is actually a chapter out of the, the telecom info project or chip a project that uh, Facebook connectivity has been supporting for years and in fact initiated it uh, as well. And it's called the open and disaggregated telcos. Gio and Rakuten are the poster children of this movement and have proven to the industry that the clock is ticking against the big vendors closed and proprietary systems. Dish Wireless places open source right on their homepage, including a direct reference to ORAN that I've noted out at the, at the bottom here. This rise is inevitable, especially from the standpoint of the future that we see is fully open and in many cases open source. Most software pundits in the industry would agree, while a good part of the telecom industry may not. We know that there's been limited success of open, open telco or open source software in the telecom industry to date. However, it is not an indicator of future by any means. On the contrary, this is precisely why we're investing and working on projects like Magma. At Facebook Connectivity, our goal remains to land commercial success of Magma, as well as other open source connectivity projects at scale, which help us bring more people online to a faster internet. Now let's look through how this announcement that we're make, making today or just made uh, about Magma open source project becoming a neutral entity it partnerships with four major industry groups who are all lined up to support the project and disprove that status quo. So they are, once again, Open Air Interface Software Alliance, Open Interface Foundation, Linux Foundation, and Telecom Info Project. So as we continue that story, before going into the details, we draw an important parallel between the adoption of open source in the enterprise space versus in the telco space that we have seen over the past decade or so. The left-hand column shows the evolution of the open source in the enterprise space over the past 10 years or more. It's been triggered by Linux that is now in every part of the software industry. It's widely known that software is eating the world and we say that open source is eating software. The window of opportunity to disrupt the telco industry, especially with open source project, as we see on the right-hand column, is the next three to five years. The early indicators show there is a surprising common signature with every disruption that is happening in the industry now, whether it is Geo, Rakuten, Dish, and that is none other than open and disaggregated network and lots of open source code. This is hardly new or news to the industry. And there are hundreds of open source telecom projects, perhaps more the merrier, at least in this case. However, it is very important to be mindful about potential fragmentation of certain parts of the telco stack. Today, we're gonna to make a case about the core stack, which is known to be a lot of bastion in the closed telco systems. Going over to the next slide, now we draw a very important distinction between the RAN and the core in telco networks. A core network is naturally disaggregated and acts as the backend of the network. 
This is unlike RAM, which remained a black box with 3GPP's S and N interfaces to connect the rest of the network for a very long time. We see strong open RAM movements that are currently underway. And we just learned two weeks back that the four largest operators in Europe have committed to go all in with open RAM. The core lends itself to a single stack implementation distributed over different parts of the network. It is a natural open source fit and can become the base implementation to be leveraged by many commercial use cases. In other words, build once, enhance many times, and thereby support all the use cases you can. I wanna make sure that we're not confusing the open core here uh, with the open, open core model of open source commercialization. Uh, there's a lot of open here. Uh, the open, open core model in the open source commercialization is about where a project is open sourcing just the core part of it, but there's a lot of non-core pieces are remain proprietary. The core we're referring to here is the packet core that is commonly known as the Evolve Packet Core or EPC in 4G LT networks and 5G core in the 5G networks. Just wanted to clarify that for our audience before going a, a bit deeper. Now going back to the RAN and core in the cellular networks, we know that RAN is a lot about the cost play. It's very CapEx heavy, at least four to five times more cost costly than a core or a backend from samples taken from a typical uh, operator network. Core on the other hand is a lot about complexity play, OPEX heavy, plagued with licensing, networking and software complexities. Still the overall core market is a, is a fairly healthy industry. Um, and when we combine the EPC, VPC, cloud EPC, it's roughly a market between 20 and $25 billion uh, and, it's raised, and it's growing uh, more than 50% uh, level over the next uh, next five years. But there's a lot of intelligence that are actually moving into core. And that, that, that estimate does not include the emerging 5G core. So now having seen sort of the open source uh, aspect of, the, of our journey and the RAN and core, the, the telco aspects of the journey, one more variable that I want to talk about, and it's none but the, uh, but the telco cloud. And I want to switch over and talk a little bit about this, this, uh, this important movement that is happening. It's called cloudification of the network. The title here should tell bulk of the story. Indeed, the level of excitement around telco cloud is unusually high and every cloud player is jumping on the bandwagon. The diagram on the left was published recently on LinkedIn that captures how all major core vendors are now offering a cloud-based core as a service to major tier one operators around the globe. It may be a little difficult to see, but you can probably spot all major packet core vendors on the right-hand column of this picture and several tier one operators on the left-hand side. It goes a level further to show what vendors are offering against which use cases the operators are leveraging the, the, the telco cloud for. If we look at the right-hand picture, IBM published this one a few months back and uh, with their launch of this, this, uh, this uh, cloud, uh, telco cloud ecosystem for the, the partners, uh, perfectly a closed ecosystem with uh, following the likes of Microsoft Azure and, and Google Cloud. More than anything, it, it appears like a logo down to us. And we see all major players, except perhaps one or two, uh, like Ericsson is, is, is missing from it. I'm sure many of you could build a similar one from major public cloud marketplace and filtering by an industry segment like telecom. And just to make the case a little bit stronger, the acquisitions of Affirm Networks and Metaswitch Networks last year by Microsoft and offering those through Azure, they happened almost back to back on the, uh, and that coincided with the wake of the pandemic, just underscoring the importance of improved connectivity and expanded connectivity for not just the US and North American markets, but for the entire globe. And we'll see later today that Magma team is working closely with AWS to cover how we will be offering Magma through, through AWS. Our view is that these kinds of ecosystems simply shift the code and telco services from traditional box vendors to the emerging cloud vendors with relatively low impact on the evolution of the actual networks. They really don't do much in terms of disrupting the industry with any sort of open telco or open source mindset. It's more about just shifting of the one closed ecosystem to another closed ecosystem. And they do not change the network dynamics or economics drastically either, except that you get a lot of cost benefits, a lot of uh, complexities from the underlying layers are now moved over to cloud that you don't have to deal with the hardware aspects and, and, and so on. So, 
now that we have seen the key, three key movements at, at play here, open and disaggregated networks, open source software stacks, and telco cloud. This is why I want to make the case why we believe that the future core of the network will be the confluence of all these factors, especially when we look at the evolution of the network core through the physical and then virtual, and then finally cloudified in a, in a pretty vendor infra locked way. So if we, if we go back around the launch of the 4G LT networks around 2008-9 timeframe, from then to, to 2014, it was all about the physical packet course of known as EPC. If we move over to 2014 to 2019, that's when the virtual packet course of VPCs have been launched and, and deployed around, um, around the globe. And finally, since last year or later part of 2019, cloud native course started appearing for both 4G and 5G. When 3GPP release 15 was ratified in 2018, it was during the, that virtualization era and missed several important characteristics for future cellular networks. A clear path for network core stacks that is developed and deployed in a vendor access and infra agnostic manner was one of those characteristics that release 17 and 18 are working to catch up. Going forward, we need a 100% API driven cloud native multi-tenant core stack that converges all kinds of networks, not just cellular, but Wi-Fi, satellite and private networks as well. And we shall see our journey to date as well as going forward throughout the day today. We see the future of network core bright with open network and open source software stack. Moving over to the next slide here. This is another title tells the whole story slide as the industry starts seeing tremendous benefits of um, open source core stacks. Even when there are parallel efforts on this, and it's a good reminder that how Kubernetes won against several other open source projects. We discovered that the, the four projects other than Magma that are relevant for the network core. However, we would like to drive Magma evolution in such a way that none of these projects will be competitors for Magma over the next couple of years. How are we doing this? We're already, already consolidating, as you saw with OAI stack, which Magma leverages, and we will see a presentation on this later today. We expect further consolidation in this space and have plans to collaborate with other projects so that we can prevent fragmentation of open source network core and hopefully see Magma win this race. I want to underscore the fact that this race is for the industry to win against the status quo on the network brain, not for Magma alone. Doing so will spark the next wave of innovation around the open source 5G movement that we heard from Arpit earlier and, and heard from Jonathan during the fireside chat. So let's see how we wanna, how we actually see that happening. Looking at deeper, Industry's most successful open source projects had three key ingredients. Magma comfortably mixes all three and creates the best suit that any access network can use. Magma was written with open APIs such that contributing features, functionalities, and use cases is super easy. We have 130 contributors and counting today. Only a fraction of them are from Facebook. The dev community is where I call for our industry groups founding partners and upcoming partners who have committed development teams to focus on Magma project evolution. We need member companies of OSA, OIF, and LF to support the project. We need all corporate partners to establish development teams. We have several startups leveraging Magma platform and contributing to it as well. We need more. We are starting to have conversations with public domain projects and excited to have the potential to work together going forward. Facebook connectivity continues to be the benevolent leader. However, as you heard the announcement, we're in the process of turning the project over to a neutral leadership with a technical steering committee, as well as the governing board. At this point, I call upon the startups working on 5G connectivity, networking, or telecom space to consider Magma as your base platform, especially if you're working on the emerging use cases like private networks, whether it's LTE or 5G, edge and IoT networks, network convergence, service convergence, network or connectivity as a service. It, these are just some of the examples. There are many more like this. And I question, 
here is that why spend time and effort in building things that will not give your startup a competitive differentiator? Consider leveraging Magma so that you can focus on your secret sauce. Open source 5G is such a hot space now and there's so many opportunities up for grabs. Speedy execution will likely determine your startup's ultimate fate. So why not gain the speed by leveraging Magma and commercialize your use case on top of it? And it goes back to um, a couple of years back, we saw a great presentation by, by Peter Levin from Anderson Horowitz um, about the, how, to, how to commercialize a open source community project. And he described how SaaS was um, already open source 2.0 and the movement was moving towards 3.0. We see network and networking and connectivity as a service as a very strong component of that open source 3.0 movement. Last but not the least, I call upon the corporations, telco operators, and investors to consider Magma for their products as well as startups, where there is a clear business case for investing in development teams on top of the platform. Reach out to Magma team, Jonathan, Brian, Phil, Michael, Amar, Boris, and many others, and let's get engaged. This is what I'm going to close out the conversation with. As we just announced the Linux Foundation um, and Magma becoming an independent project there, it's really important to sort of like show who our founding partners are and how these entities are connected in a little bit deeper than what Yale had announced. So I would like to take this opportunity to clarify the roles and responsibilities between TIP Open Core Network uh, Group, Magma Community Project and Facebook Magma. Each of these entities have very specific roles and responsibilities to play towards an open and disaggregated network core, as well as the open source project around Magma. TIPOCN is an open and disaggregated core networking ecosystem that is addressing what 3GPP did not address along with a few adjacent blank spaces, for example, private networks and, and other emerging use cases. TIPOCN goal is to enable different vendor solutions to play nice with each other and, and and that's regardless of whether they leverage Magma code or not. And they would enable uh, basically interoperability test, lab trial, field trial, such that we can see a smooth path forward for, for, this, uh, for an open disaggregated core network ecosystem to make it into deployment and into production with different operators around the globe. And I'd like to emphasize that Magma is not as equal to open core network. And then both are necessary to complement each other towards this path of the eventual uh, open core network um, in the industry. You can think of this as the Oran Alliance and the Oran software community as a similar example, how TIPOCN and Magma project would relate to each other. Now, the second entity, which is at the center of this is the Magma community project, is the open source project that uses 3GPP standards and OCN requirements and several uh, specs from the community to build a commercial grade Converge core stack and OCN ecosystem members, as well as the OIF and LF members can use components from Magma projects to accelerate their product development. Use this as a reference code, seed code whenever possible. So that's the role of Magma community project. And finally, Facebook Magma productizes and commercializes Magma open source project. We initiated the project and we basically uh, moved it forward to a community project However, we continue to commercialize, uh, productize and commercialize the project with, uh, for the use cases that help bring more people to a faster internet. That is sort of like our focus area at Facebook Connectivity. And, uh, and, and going forward, we absolutely would like to see a thriving open source community growing around Magma in the, in the community and the industry and we'll continue to support it. That is sort of how Facebook Magma team and Facebook Connectivity uh, fits into the picture and then the, the very important part is just this example that we have laid out at the bottom. We're proud to be doing this today with this with these great companies like Deutsche Telekom, Arm, Qualcomm, um, and these great startups, Freedom Fi, uh, Shoelace Wireless, and uh, Zero Chain, and so on. And uh, there'll be a series of peer uh, press releases going out today uh, throughout the day, and uh, we'll sort of like a very excited to be uh, uh, to see to have you here today with us to see through listen through the exciting projects and for the development. This is a developer conference, 
And obviously we would like to keep the focus on the technologies that we're working on and the emerging use cases that we're working on. And I'd like to finish up by basically saying that we cannot build a community alone. We need all of your help and active participation for Magma community to succeed. And with that, once again, I'd like to thank you for your time and wish that you find this time very useful. I hope, I, I believe that we have a few minutes for, for Q and A and I'm going to um, flash, I'm not gonna talk about this, but uh, there's a couple of incubation projects that we're already on. And I'd like to just flash those through as we take the questions. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Phil. No, I'm not. Uh, I think Kendall's going to lead the Q&A oh. for this session. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, please. That's okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kendall. Uh, yeah. So yes, yeah, so if anyone has um, any questions for Shaw, um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask them, or you can ask them in the chat or Slack or wherever you feel comfortable. Kendall, I see one in the uh, chat currently. Um, looks like this one is actually for Irfan and OAI. There were um, some very great initiatives started as part of OAI, uh, Kate's Cups, Local Breakout, et cetera. Will strategy for those programs change going forward? Irfan, would you like to take that? Or I can provide my perspective. Uh, yes, Shah, please go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in if needed. Yeah, so, so the short answer is that no, that, that should not. And I think this is a, an opportunity we're taking to also uh, very much clarify the Magma project evolution, which is gonna be uh, in, in parallel and in, in, a, in a great partnership with the OAI uh, uh, focus on the, the core stack and the work that they're doing uh, over there. And we have a specific press release that covers that. And we wanna tell the industry that it's it, the projects are complementary to each other. And what, what we're building a commercial grade production ready core that is usable for a wide variety of use cases, whereas OAI is gonna be focusing on a research core or an R&D core, whether it's the 4G version of it or whether it's a 5G SA version of it. So that's sort of the short answer. If I'm, you'd like to add anything. Yes, definitely, Shah. So, so in fact, uh, you know, this is exactly where we are sitting. Right now, there's going to be a press release on the OSA website, openairinterface.org, at uh, uh, 10 uh, a.m. Uh, today. That is going to explain this in more detail with the perspective of different partners. Um, so yes, uh, Open Air Interface Software Alliance, Alliance as you know, uh, does um, has its own um, you know, activities. Uh, these are part of, uh, you know, what we build as a fully compliant uh, 3GPP, uh, 4G, 5G core uh, that uh, is destined for research and, uh, um, you know, activities that are um, more uh, in line with, uh, with, with the research aspect of things. We are not building, um, you know, um, a commercial core, which is uh, sort of the ambition of the Magma project. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, collaboration between the two uh, activities. Uh, you will have different flavors of, uh, of components that uh, you asked about that will uh, remain available and uh, they will keep developing. And, um, you know, um, people can pick and choose different uh, things for different use cases. And uh, basically the idea is that this is uh, very, very complementary both projects. Thank you, Ivan. So Prakash here, I have a question for uh, both uh, Arpit and Shah Raman. What are you thinking in terms of uh, open RAN, ORAN integration with uh, Magma Core? Any thoughts on that? Uh, sure. Uh, Do you want me to start and then? Yeah, Arpit, Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, I think for those of you who are uh, familiar with the ORAN uh, Alliance, right? Linux Foundation hosts the software portion of it called ORAN SC. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, right? as we move towards end-to-end -to -end, uh, solutions and use cases, uh, several of these projects, uh, all the way from access to edge to the core, uh, you know, in this sense, packet core, uh, and then from data plane up through the stack, they all need to either interoperate or work together to make you know, connectivity happen. So we have to look into specific uh, integration points as, as um, 
as we move forward. But this is kind of, again, allowing us from a neutral perspective to sort of look at it, bring the communities together and see what is possible and what is required. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Arpit. And just to kind of like share a little bit of what's happening on the ground, uh, we are looking at the, um, the integration between the core and the ORAN uh, in the lab as we speak. So there is absolutely uh, no reason for them not to interoperate because most of the interfaces are standardized, whether by 3GPP or by ORAN. So uh, there will be more work necessary, as RP pointed out. But uh, the plan is to absolutely have that um, in our roadmap. And actually, we'll see that a little bit later in the day that we point out that at one at what point we can say there is an end-to-end -end open network that comprise components from open RAN, open core, and um, other components. Okay. Thank you. A uh, question for Shah. Uh, this is Suresh from Kalum. A hey, uh, really nice presentation. I really like the vision that, like all of you shared, to like converge all these like multiple core projects and uh, get rid of the fragmentation, right? So, like, what is the high level thinking behind it? Is it like you know the merging of the code bases, or is it like more uh, agreements outside that like everybody starts contributing into the magma code base? Have you any thoughts on that? That's a great question. And this is where we probably have to spend a, a lot more time together to really understand. Um, overall goal remains the same, that let's make sure we're not fragmenting the open source community. And that's with the spirit of these different industry groups coming together to support uh, the, the, the Magma project. Again, the, with the goal of that, once again, I'll underscore that piece that the commercial grade production ready packet core that can be deployed at scale. Right? That's kind of like what we're looking at. And that doesn't necessarily mean that um, the, we're kind of gonna support uh, the traditional centralized core or PPC or VPC use cases. In fact, quite the opposite. We're looking forward towards a more cloud native multi-tenant uh, programmable core that works with open RAN and so on, right? Now, when it comes to um, sort of like um, consolidating or, or sort of like uh, the other open source projects that are in the play here, we are uh, like, we, we did this with OAI and it was relatively easy because we've, we've leveraged their code base, right? When it comes to the other projects, whether we talk about free 5 gc or, uh, or OMEC, we have conversations, we're starting to have the conversations with them to understand um, how, how that, that uh, collaboration is gonna look like. I, I don't think that we have a clear picture yet that you know, we're just gonna start taking code and start uh, mingling them together or we're gonna just um, basically figure out not at the code level, but more of the documentation and 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 other levels to figure out uh, how to how to keep them uh, together. Or there there could also be that just like OAI, there's a purpose of the research core. There may be certain use cases that may make sense to like for them to coexist. So those are various possibilities we're evaluating, and we want to be working with the project leads of those projects to make sure we do the right thing that makes sense for the industry. And we welcome all of them to participate with us in evolution of magma, if that's that we can kind of align towards the uh, sort of like a one strong open source project as we're calling the, the Kubernetes of the network core. Does that make sense? Perfect. Yeah, perfect, Asha. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Of course, yeah. All right, we probably have um, time for just yeah. one more question. So, um, if anyone wants to speak up on that question, I know we have quite a few in the chat, but um, continue to put your questions in the chat and Slack and we'll make sure to get them all answered. One more. Yes, let's just pick one here. Um, if we develop software application on top of Magma Community Edition, do we need to donate it back to community or can we commercialize it? You absolutely can. I don't believe that we're putting any sort of restrictions that you have to upstream code. Um, but, but, but just to be clear on that, that any successful community would have to put certain level of ground rules in place. And that's what we're designing with the, the governing board as well as the technical steering committee. And it's, it's driven by the developers who become maintainers and who become part of the steering committee. So there's gonna be fleshed out, but to your, Simple question, the short answer is that we don't see a problem in, in kind of doing what we call like the basically the forks, right? So that you're not, and you don't have much intention to uh, upstream and, and so on. But we do ask that to, to build a healthy community 
in order for us to build a healthy community, for you to at least at the baseline contribute the, the bug fixes back, you may be finding a lot of bugs and that's where aligning the communities to build a strength that maybe the, the projects uh, are able to fund and, and basically um, do in-house that gets missing on the open source project. But the power of bringing all these uh, hundreds of thousands of developers to work together to find the bugs to make the stack robust is I think where we're going to stand out and give us a fair chance to actually compete against those closed systems. So I think we can share more details, but the short story is yes. And the longer version is that let's look at the technical a steering committee to come up with their with their rules and uh, sort of like uh, the ways for for rules of engagement or, or contribution per se. Okay. Hey, hey, Shaw, can I chime in just a little bit on that one answer? Because that's an answer related to the license, I want to make it perfectly clear. The BSD three clause license absolutely allows someone to build a project on top of Magma and does not explicitly require you to share it back. That is a foundation of the license. And then add on the, the color commentary you offered about how much we would appreciate it if you did contribute back bug fixes and derivative works. So thanks. Yeah, thanks, Phil. I, I kind of like deliberately avoided getting to the license response part. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, and, and I think with that, um, I think I'm out of time, but this is, I just wanna say one thing that when many startups and many companies and, and public domain projects leverage Magma and you can commercialize them for different use cases, that is probably the key metric of success we're looking at. So there is no restriction, please don't feel any restriction. It's quite the opposite. Go commercialize, please do that. And we wanna see many, many projects commercializing based on Magma. With that, I'd like to step out and have back to uh, Phil and Kendall. Thank you, everybody.